Hello, everyone, and welcome to week two of Poll 101, American National Government. This week, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to the debates leading up to the U.S. Constitution and a very short overview of our Federalist system of government. I know there's a lot going on this week, so I will do my best to make this video short and succinct. I highly encourage you read the chapters from your textbook as a great deal of testing material will come from both my online lectures and your text. So let's begin. Now, usually I would spend about an entire week's worth of lectures covering the historical events leading to the Declaration of Independence. But as I mentioned in week one, I'm going to try my best to have these lectures uh, only present the most important material to you. I don't think anyone wants to sit through two hours of videos as much as I would enjoy making them. Uh, so each week I'm just going to try to present these main points here and I strongly encourage you to read the textbook for more in-depth information regarding these topics which you will see on your examinations. So with that being said, let's get started. The French and Indian War was a pivotal moment in American history for the colonists. What you really need to know is that during this time, the French and the British were fighting for control over the Ohio River Valley. Since the war was primarily financed by the British to secure the colonies, and war is expensive, they needed to tax the colonies to ameliorate their war debt. And after a series of tax increases, we arrive at the no taxation without representation debate among the American colonies. The UK ravages France and reclaims almost all French territory in America. The war, which was almost 10 years long, cost about $70 million, uh, and not to mention more than doubled Britain's national debt. So Britain decides to tax the American colonists to raise revenue to cover the war debt. After all, British soldiers were shipped to America, they kept the colonists safe during the war, the least the colonists could do was offer some meager taxes to pay for their protection. And that's precisely how the British Empire saw the issue. But that is not at all how the colonists saw it. What the colonists saw was a power-hungry, imperialistic empire that was willing to risk anything in pursuit of world domination. And remember, these colonies were pretty autonomous at the time. They had their own state legislature, organized their own elections, had their own criminal justice systems. And because these colonial governments had so much power, the British government did not see it necessary to have these colonies represented in the British Parliament. So the colonists have no say in foreign policy or trade decisions of the British Empire, and also no say in how Britain planned to recoup its financial losses after the war, so they were pretty upset after Britain launched a series of tax initiatives on the colonists for about a decade after the French and Indian War. Things finally boil over in 1773 when the British government levies a tax on tea. Now, fun fact, there's a common misconception that the tea tax greatly increased the price of tea, which led to the Boston Tea Party, but really, the 1773 Tea Act was actually a major reformation to its predecessor, the 1772 Tea Act, and it actually drastically reduced the tax on tea. But the 1773 Tea Act represented more than 10 years of failed taxation policies without any progress being made over the colonists' primary concern, no taxation without representation. And therefore, they threw about 90,000 pounds of tea into the Boston Harbor, which equates to approximately $2 million in today's dollars. So the, the British Empire was quite upset with this act of protest. Things moved pretty quickly in the aftermath of the Boston Tea Party. The Coercive Acts dissolved completely the Massachusetts state government to set an example for any colonies who wanted to attack the crown again. And in response, various leaders of the colonies gather in Philadelphia for the First Continental Congress to discuss how the colonies should respond to what they deemed an excessive use of force from the British crown. Not much was achieved until the Second Continental Congress in 1775, where major debates began to arise about formally declaring independence from the British Empire, and by 1776, the Declaration of Independence was formally issued. <laughs> 
The U.S. Constitution was strongly influenced by the political philosophies of John Locke, primarily by the idea of the social contract that all Americans, well, really wealthy white male Americans at this point, but more on that later, were entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this was a radical statement, at least for the time, to be spelled out in a governing document. One thing that I'd like you to know in particular, though, is that the Declaration of Independence did not create a new form of government for the American colonies. All the document did was dissolve colonial allegiances with Britain. The first form of government in the United States was established by the Articles of Confederation, and this form of government had a significant number of flaws. The central government had no power to tax, there was no executive or presidency, trade could not be centrally regulated, and unanimous consent was required for the passage of all legislation. So essentially, each state operated as its own little country with its own set of rules, currency, and political autonomy, which as you can imagine, made it extraordinarily difficult for a centralized government to function and exert collective influence. Shay's Rebellion is often attributed as the final nail in the coffin for the Articles of Confederation. Now, Daniel Shays, a veteran of the Revolutionary War, led an uprising of a little more than a thousand participants against the Massachusetts government when they tried to foreclose on his and other veterans' farms. Now, this was about two years after the Revolutionary War had ended, but can you imagine being a patriot of the American Revolutionary War? war uh, and then the government that you fought to create coming after you to take your property uh, because you can't pay your taxes and this was really a function of the unsustainable government structure that had been created no fault of the farmers themselves but the reaction to that fighting for a government to exist and then they come to take your property it was extraordinarily unacceptable uh, and there was a lot of people who were willing to fight for Shay's cause um, the massachusetts government pretty disturbed by this movement, a bit worried, they pleaded for the central government to help. But because the national legislature required complete unanimity, the central government could do nothing. They could provide no resources, no money. They had no money to give, no national guard. That didn't even exist at the time. And it was the final sign that the Articles of Confederation were doomed as one state could barely hold off roughly a thousand armed, angry farmers. Ultimately, politicians begin to recognize that a weak, decentralized government in the eyes of the Articles of Confederation did not have sufficient power to govern, particularly in the case of such a large country as the United States. So two alternative plans for governance were presented at the Constitutional Convention of 1787. The Virginia Plan, or the Big State Plan, emphasized power. If you live in a state with a lot of people in it, you should have greater representation in Congress. This was their belief. They wanted one powerful individual president to oversee the executive branch and a single national judiciary or Supreme Court to consist of judges chosen by the states. Uh, this was the structure of the government the Federalists advocated for. The New Jersey Plan, or Small State Plan, on the other hand, emphasized representation. It shouldn't matter how many people live in each state, we should all be represented equally. The thought of one centralized head of the executive sounded a lot like monarchy, and that's why the New Jersey plan, the anti-federalist advocated for a plural executive or multiple heads of state. Essentially, they wanted a uh, cabinet of presidents or executives. Uh, and the plan for the judiciary was basically the same. And ultimately, we ended up with basically a combination of both plans via the Connecticut Compromise. So you might be thinking to yourselves, oh, wow, the Virginia plan sounds a lot like the House of Representatives. The New Jersey plan sounds a lot like the Senate. And that's exactly what happened in the Connecticut Compromise. They just combined both of these plans into a bicameral legislature. Now, it's important to note that the debates between the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists were highly divisive. Uh, 
Chief among those concerns were drafting a new governing document and addressing the institution of slavery. Federalist or large states refused to budge on the issue of slavery as slave labor constituted a significant portion of southern states' economic productivity. Thus, anti-federalists saw no other way to convince southern states to ratify the Constitution without making some type of concession to southern states on the issue of slavery. You see, the primary concern between the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists boiled down to how much representation each state would get in the National Legislature or Congress. In the Northern states, which advocated representation be equal among all states, the slave population was exceedingly small. However, in the larger southern states, which advocated representation be based on population, a significant portion of the population was made up by slaves. So southern states are in this bizarre and completely immoral catch-22. They don't want to abolish slavery and grant citizenship because they do not wish to have their power challenged by enfranchising slaves with the vote. At the same time, by not granting this significant portion of the population citizenship or the right to vote, as we can see from this graph here, we're talking about almost 40% of the population in the South, the South thus forfeits having slaves counted as part of their populace, thus reducing their overall representation in the House of Representatives because slaves, by definition, could not be counted as people. So this brings us to one of the more unsavory compromises in American history, the Three-Fifths Compromise. When determining how many representatives each state receives in Congress, the South agreed that three out of every five slaves should be counted towards the state's overall representation in Congress, which is really, when you think about it, just astonishing. The, the basis of the Revolutionary War was to fight against a government institution that did not allow representation. And here we see the U.S. repeating that very mistake. Though the Anti-Federalists at least possess the foresight of amending a Bill of Rights to the U.S. Constitution, and we will discuss that in great lengths during the Civil Liberties Lecture um, next week. And finally, the last thing I'd like you to be aware of regarding the Constitution is the structure of the first three articles of the document. We can tell a lot about the Founders' intentions for how the government ought to function in its prioritization of each branch just by looking at the ordering and the extent of content in each article. Article 1, which discusses the powers of Congress, is first for a reason. As you can see from this figure, the Founders intentionally spent the most time discussing Congress because they believe this branch ought to be the most powerful. The second article discusses the powers of the presidency, and Article 3 discusses the powers of the judiciary. And clearly, the founders had no idea how they wanted to structure courts in this country, um, and it was the shortest and most ambiguous of all of the three articles. And uh, again, we'll discuss the, the content of each of these articles in far more detail when we get to Unit 3 and discuss government institutions. Now, I'd like to briefly outline our specific form of democracy, federalism. Federalism is a system of government where power is divided between the national or federal government and various regional or state governments. As you can see from this graphic, voters retain the primary source of power in this type of government, and they decide who is elected to both the federal and the state levels. So in this model, the voters decide how much power to give the central government and how much power to give the state government. Federalism differs from other types of government whereby voters possess the most direct influence on who is elected to each level of office. Other systems of democratic governance include unitary systems by which voters elect members to the central or federal government, uh, but then it is the federal government who gives power to the smaller or local governments. Uh, and confederations, which is the type of government that we had in the U.S. prior to the Constitution, is kind of the opposite of a unitary system. In this system, voters give power to the states, and then those more powerful states then give 
how much of her power they decide to the weaker central government. So federalism is unique because voters simultaneously give power to both the state and the central government. Not only is government divided between the states and the federal government, but power is also separated between three separate institutions, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. This is referred to as the separation of powers. And again, we will discuss this at great lengths in unit three when we discuss government institutions. The state governments have a structural organization similar to that of the national level. Each state has an executive leader, like the president, uh, known as the governor. Uh, each state also has their own legislature, usually a, a state legislature or a general assembly, just like the U.S. Congress. And states have their own judicial systems, their own state courts, uh, and their own supreme courts as well. Let's take Wisconsin, for example. Uh, in Wisconsin, the executive leader is the governor, Tony Evers. Uh, Wisconsin has its own state legislature with a House and a Senate. Uh, and Wisconsin also has its own judicial system, the Supreme Court of Wisconsin, with seven justices. Now, the numbers uh, of, of offices for each level vary greatly state to state depending on how populous that state is uh, but the the general model prevails uh, this separation of powers really dictates the structure of government both at the state level and the federal level now if you might be wondering well what exactly does federalism look like what kind of powers do the states have that's unique from the federal government and and one of the key aspects of federalism means that each state is free to design its own laws regulations and policies in the absence of overarching federal mandates or laws. And one of my favorite examples of how state laws can vary so drastically from state to state is by examining different state regulations on alcohol consumption and purchasing. So for instance, in Utah, beer that is greater than 5% alcohol by volume can only be sold in state stores. In Alabama, beer stronger than 13.9% ABV is just not allowed. In Florida, you can't have bottles sold that are larger than 32 ounces. In Georgia, where I'm from, uh, there is a 14% ABV cap on all beer unless it's purchased directly at breweries, I think. There's this uh, brewery loophole. Uh, Oklahoma, which is where I was born, beer stronger than 4% ABV can only be sold at room temperature. So if you want to buy anything that's like stronger than Natty Light, like it's just on the floor of the gas station, um, hot. And the, I guess the idea is that um, if you buy it at room temp, uh, you have to go home and put it in the fridge before you can drink it. Otherwise, like, I guess they just assume you're buying like a 24 pack of cold beer, put it in your passenger seat, pop it open and, and drive home because you just can't wait. I, I don't understand. Um, in Kansas, many counties require restaurants to earn at least 30% of profits from food before they can sell alcohol. Uh, and in New York, beer and liquor cannot be sold in the same stores. It's, it's so bizarre. And of course, there's a, a lot of religious influence in these type of laws as well. But like, I just have to tell you, moving to Wisconsin, it is just beautiful that I can go into Target and buy a handle of whiskey. That is just beyond me. Um, it's certainly not like that in Georgia at all. The only places that you can buy alcohol uh, are in gas stations or liquor stores. So it's just hilarious to me that like being at the Target in La Crosse, you know, there's people picking out bottles of wine and then you just look across the store and there's, you know, baby supplies. It's just, it's very funny to me. I love it here. Uh, you guys are awesome. Okay, moving on. Why does such policy disparity exist among the states? Well, primarily the reason that federalism exists really boils down to the 10th Amendment in the Constitution. Powers that are not delegated to the United States, meaning the federal government, by the Constitution, not prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. 
So basically, if the federal government does not have a specific codified law on a given issue, then it's a free for all for the states to decide how they want to regulate that issue however they see fit. And this is why we see crazy disparities uh, on the, you know, legalization of marijuana. And prior to 2010, a wide variety of, of uh, state laws on, on gay rights and gay marriage and this and that. Um, so it, it's not until the federal government steps in and says, this is the law of the land. That's the supremacy clause in the Constitution, which we'll talk about later. But until the federal government steps in and says, hey, y'all, this is how it's going to be. States can pretty much do whatever they want. And you can imagine that, you know, kind of creates some disparities and problems within our country when, you know, you've got half of the country saying one thing is legal and then the other half says that it's not, uh, not the best for continuity of the law. Okay, and the last thing that I want to talk about, I know, I'm sorry, this is already a long video. There's a whole bunch more stuff that I want to talk about in this video, but I'm going to, I'm going to cut y'all a break and try to make it short. The last thing I just want to talk about uh, are these concentric circles of government power between the national government and the state government and the shared powers that both the national government and the state government enjoy. So obviously these are fantastic exam questions. What are exclusive powers to the national government? Well, the national government gets to declare war. They regulate interstate commerce, which is commerce between states. Uh, it is in the national government's purview to admit new states. They set standard standards for weights and measurements, establish post offices, print money, enter into treaties with foreign governments. Those are all powers of the national government. On the state government side, states get to establish schools, regulate intrastate commerce or commerce within the state, issue marriage and driver's license, ratify amendments to the U.S. Constitution, establish local governments, and assume powers not delegated to the national government. Now, this last one here is really the Tenth Amendment. If it's not delegated to the national government, then the state governments get to decide how to regulate that thing. And then this tiny area here in the middle are shared powers. So both the national and the state governments by the Constitution have the power to levy taxes, maintain law and order, build highways, borrow money, charter banks, and establish courts. So I know a lot of information has been presented here. We still have a long way to go. I'm going to kind of uh, try to give you an overview of the history of federalism and how the balance of power has shifted between national governments and the state governments uh, in the next lecture for week three. Go ahead and read up on that in chapter two of your textbook, which was assigned this week. Um, I'm going to cut it off here before it gets far too long, um, but I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions in the discussion board. And as always, thank you for watching.